Do you think it's possible that the rise and perversion of postmodern thought that is infecting our major institutions and sense-making apparatus is part of a calculated plan by outside forces to destabilize the U.S. from the inside out? Would it, it would be easier for a foreign power to take control in the midst of a civil war. Yes, it would. Yeah. Um, I would yes, say a number would. of things are true. We've been watching this uh, school of thought gain power since the 90s, right? Um, and so it's very unlikely that this was seeded by a foreign power um, with intent. That's, it's too long a period of time for it to have unfolded. However, it doesn't mean, especially in our modern environment with algorithms and the like, it doesn't mean that somebody is not taking opportunistic advantage of our conflict over these things and amplifying certain sentiments because it is in their interest that we be divided. I mean, the fact is, divide and conquer is well understood as a core strategy for winning. This is yep. dividing us very finely and in a way from which there's no obvious recovery. So um, it is almost certain that our enemies will have noticed that and that they will be attempting to amplify it to what degree that's what's going on. I don't know. But I will say my discussion with the DHS officer... Um, that we talked about in the first hour, one of the things he said several different times was that he believed we were being played, that we were being pushed towards racial conflict, and that that was not uh, inherent to who we were, that it was somehow being um, imposed. I asked him who he thought was doing it. He wasn't sure, but he had the, he had the sense that that's what was going on. One hypothesis implicit in this question um, might be that the effectively postmodern takeover of the academy in the West, in the U.S. in particular, uh, could have been encouraged, facilitated with resources from outside. And that's a, that's a testable hypothesis, the idea that the, the rise of these grievance studies departments, gender studies and African-American studies and Latin X studies and, and all of these things, uh, started... I think it started in the 90s, but it really took off sort of mid-aughts uh, through, through now. And um, those departments don't bring in any money. And in general, what we've seen is a move within universities uh, away from, you know, basically towards a business model in which you are, you are valued as faculty and as a department on the basis of how much external funds you bring in, since a large fraction of those funds then goes to make the college run or the university run. So how were those departments uh, being paid for? And I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know how it was that so many such departments got created. And once they were there, then you, they were they had effectively already gamed the system because now when you count up departments and say oh we're going to have a vote and see who wants to pass this measure across the entire campus well now we've got you know twelve departments that are they're bullshit um, but they already exist. So I want to um, I I don't know the answer to the question mm -hmm. but I do wonder if there's just a perverse incentive around creating those departments mm -hmm. that basically... Oh, I, th I mean, that's... Sorry, but I, I that's the hypo That's what we have been assuming, right? Like yeah. that's, and that's still what I think is likely true. Um, yeah. But I actually... It occurs to me that I have no idea. Right. It where the both. funding might be coming from. Like, where, where did the funding come from, given that those departments cannot pay for themselves? Well, I don't know that they cannot pay for themselves in the sense that um, students... It doesn't take very much... If you have six departments that basically are, it's a pseudo replication of the idea that all there is is power. And that looks that way from the point of view of women, that looks that way from the point of view of this group, that group, one after the other. Mm -hmm. It's all the same point, mm -hmm. right? The, I don't, my guess would be that the faculty in those departments are not expensive. The space to teach is not expensive. And that basically, to the extent that large numbers of students think that they want to learn, that what they want to learn when they get to college is about their own experience, you know, close up with a microscope or something like that, that basically this brings in tuition dollars, gives people something that it isn't hard for them to get a degree in. And so in a sense, they will make the trade. I can well, imagine. Well, so I, I think I, I was disagreeing with you up until that last point. The idea that these are effectively gimme degrees, that if you if you get into some school and then you decide I'm going to major in one of those things, uh, I, I think it's pretty hard to fail out. Yeah, right? it's, it's rocks uh, for so, jocks. Um, 
you know, without any rocks right. and actually without, <laughs> without any jocks rocks. either. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But with neither rocks nor jocks. Um, but you, what you do have are equ equally inexpensive to run by your rubric departments, things like philosophy and literature uh, that do actually have standards, at least they used to, and they still ought to because we need the humanities. Uh, those many schools are, uh, are getting rid of those departments. They are slowly weaning, you know, the, the faculty away, but the difference is that it's harder and harder to attract students to those departments because it's just as hard to make a living with a degree in philosophy almost as it is to make a degree with a living in Chicano studies. Um, but it's actually, you're actually going to have to do some work to get a degree in philosophy. And, you know, it, it, it shouldn't be just as hard because philosophy is real. And, you know, we, we, we certainly, we know some remarkable philosophers who I am quite sure when Christina Hoff Summers was on, uh, on a faculty somewhere that she was actually educating people. And I believe that Peter Bogosian still is when, you know, so long as he's a allowed to by PSU as just two philosophers that, um, come to the, off the top of my head. Uh, whereas I don't believe that students emerge with much more than a sense of their perennial victimhood from the grievance studies fields. Right. And so if you're talking about, um, you know, fields that are inexpensive to run, yeah. the, the grievance studies fields offer people, I mean, basically by saying right up front, the only thing that counts is lived experience. You're effectively declaring that there's nothing to learn and therefore yep. let's hear what you faced. Yep. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's a gimme for students and for faculty too. I mean, this is this is what lazy faculty do. They they create a situation in which they have to do nothing, and uh, demonstrate that they know nothing, which would be hard because in many cases they do know nothing, and um, and then they're all you know they get paid and the students get a degree, and it's a handshake in which uh, something of value in the market but of no actual value in reality has been exchanged. 